Uh, this is the last class. You've made it to the end, and so we're grateful for that. Today I want to end on, um, we're a little behind, but I want to I talk a little bit more about uh, Luther, for Bonnie's sake, and, uh, and, uh, and Calvin, for my sake, and, uh, <laughs> and for the benefit of you all. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about them. I uh, also want to say, a big, give a big shout out to our friends, Mark and Tracy Delahant, who are watching uh, by uh, the interwebs there up in North Carolina, and he told me that they, w- they watched the whole uh, Inquirer's class, so they're, uh, I guess they're going to join our church. I don't know, they've never been here before, but uh, no, kidding. But anyway, friend, friends of ours, so grateful. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about um, Hyena, about uh, high church and low church again, and just to remind you of this spectrum. And I, I sometimes call this folk church because uh, that's low church sounds sounds a little uh, degrading. It's not not, but so again, um, Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, and then you know in various uh, Lutheran, Episcopal. You might even think of Methodist. Methodist ca- actually came out of. Anglicanism, and then here you think of um, non-denominational, um, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Baptist, and then Anabaptist, meaning um, Quakers and Shakers, and Jim and Tammy Baker, like I said. All right, so I, I think this is helpful because it, hey Phil, uh, it helps us to see the whole spectrum of Christian expression through the centuries. And um, you can see benefits to both sides of this. There's, uh, there's tradition here, there's continuity. We're always concerned about the next generation. And so this, this, is, a gen- this is an expression of the Christian church that is really focused on the next generation, passing on a body of knowledge and doctrine, and tradition, and practice, habits to the next generation. So that's some of the benefits here. Also, a kind of hierarchy and external authority uh, outside of the local congregation, so that the local congregation has a court of appeal, as it were. Normally on this side, it's a bishop. Uh, And then on this side, again, freedom. Uh, You know, someone has said, hanging out, in McDonald's won't make you a hamburger, or hanging out in a parking garage won't make you a car. And so on this side, we emphasize to our young people, just going to church doesn't make you a Christian. You know, there, there is a personal response that's called for, and that's what is kind of the emphasis on this side. Uh, being born again, having an experience, an encounter with God, you know, actually a conversion, coming to believe. So you see uh, on, on both sides. And... Um, Again, last week we talked about the sacraments and how on this side the emphasis is on the automatic and on the practitioner. So grace is automatically given, ex opere operato, out of the working it is worked. So if the priest who's been given authority from the church, who in some sense has been given the keys to the kingdom, the keys uh, in the succession of Peter, if he does something, it's done. Again, if he baptizes you, then you have received the grace of forgiveness. And uh, as, as we've said, we've been to Catholic funerals where we know for sure the person did not believe, uh, but the priest speaks very confidently of the person being in heaven now. Why? Because ex opere operato. It, faith was kind of instilled in them, as it were, or grace was, was given to them by the priest working baptism or last rites or uh, extreme unction, as they call it, or whatever. Again, on this side, um, uh, well, let me, let me use this again in terms of the sacraments. On this side, the, the emphasis is on the automatic, and it's on the practitioner. On this side, it's on experience, and uh, the, the memory, or the, what, what the participant, so the practitioner and the participant, just trying to give you some categories to help you remember it. Here's the emphasis is on the, uh, on the person who is undergoing the sacrament. So, for instance, um, 
in, and I'm so conscious that I have a Baptist minister in front of me here, so I'm being very careful to what I, what I talk about here, because uh, I, don't, I don't want Winston to come up to me and say, you misrepresented me. But, and and I, I want to remind, uh, I know, I know, <laughs> I'm, I'm an I'm a offensive person. Um, I want to remind everybody, and uh, I met with Jonathan and Kara this week, you know, just re- reminded them, especially now in, in this particular juncture of American history, I think we have to be very careful to talk about us, meaning Christians, you know, because it's the us and them now. If we ever had the luxury of the us and them being the Presbyterians against the Lutherans, we don't have that luxury anymore. It's just us and them. It's Christians and the rest of the world. So, you know, we need to, everything we have in common, we need to uh, reaffirm to one another and, and really make that clear. So I know some churches are always splitting hairs in the pulpit, and there might have been a time for that. I just don't think it's now. Right now, we just need to be us and them. Us is the Christian church, whatever that looks like, whatever name you go by. So love the Baptists. Uh, and the Charismatics, and you know, even when John MacArthur writes a book against the Charismatics, that just kind of gets my hackles up, and I, I just feel like um, you know, we need to be really charitable toward one another. Um, what's the, it's, I think it's attributed to Augustine, though I think he didn't say it. It was, um, in essentials, unity, in differences, charity, in all things charity. I don't, I don't know what the three things are, but anyway, it's, you get it. <laughs> all right, so, so we need to be centered on the, on the unity, on the, on the essentials, and charitable with things we d- differ. But that said, we are Presbyterians, and I've waited to the end to tell you what Presbyterianism is about, and, and uh, what, what I would say here is the emphasis can, I don't think it's historically necessary to look at it that way, but it can be uh, on the experience of the person, rather than what we say, it points to a hill far away. What does baptism point to? It doesn't point, in our understanding, it doesn't point to the conversion of the person. It points to what happened as our bedrock hope on a hill far away. All right? So what is a sacrament? A sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ, wherein by sensible signs, water, bread and wine, those are the sensible signs, Holy ordinance instituted by Christ, wherein by sensible signs, Christ and the benefits of the new covenant are represented, sealed, and applied to believers. All right, so um, we're not pointing to me. This is not about I have decided to follow Jesus. This is about what happened on a hill far away. And that's what the sacraments of communion and baptism, in our estimation, point to. It doesn't point to something subjective, that happens in a person, it points to something objective that happened at a point in history on a hill far away. And that's a little bit of the difference. And you can see how in America, um, where everything is subjective, and we talked about that when it came to relating to one another as members of the church, uh, everything is subjective. I mean, even, uh, you know, your gender is subjective now. It's like, how do you feel like a man or feel like a woman? Because that determines what you, what you are. Really? Uh, you, you can see that in this overly subjective emotional soup in which we swim, this is very meaningful to people. And uh, I'll share this. Uh, J- Jonathan and Kara met with me this week to talk a little bit about denominations and sacraments and what have you. And um, uh, imagine a person who gets baptized and uh, maybe second grade. How old is Monroe? Nine. So he's in third grade? Fourth grade. All right. So someone around that, this age says, uh, Mom and Dad, I want to get baptized. I, I believe the gospel. All right. So we bring him in and we, we get him baptized. And then um, end of middle school comes. And you know, there's challenges and temptations that come at the end of middle school, and maybe he completely, I'm trying to be sensitive here, and speaking in somewhat veiled terms about what those temptations may be. I don't want to give any ideas, you know. Um, but suppose he succumbs or she succumbs to temptation, and, and then coming into high school, he goes to a uh, fellowship of Christian athletes get-together, 
and at the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, the gospel is presented, and he's sitting there thinking, I'm already a Christian, I'm already a Christian, and he thinks, but I've really given in to temptation. Raises his hand, goes forward, and says uh, to mom and dad, you know, when I was baptized as a second grader, it didn't really mean anything to me. And mom and dad say, oh, okay. Uh, but now I really believe. And so he gets baptized again. And then he goes away to college. And once again, you know, college is like a rite of passage today. And sadly, it's a rite of passage into sin for a lot of people, you know. So maybe this child who's baptized as a second grader, then as a middle schooler, then as a, a college student, he's partying and, you know, again, just living the worldly life. And his roommate says, hey, would you like to come to a navigators meeting with me one day? And so he goes, navigators? I don't really know what that's about, but I'm into the Navy, so sure, I'll go to the navigators. So he goes to the navigators meeting, and once again, it's a very uh, thoughtful uh, presentation of the gospel. Now on his level as a college student, he's a thinker, maybe some apologetic questions are answered for him. And and, uh, he says, he calls home, dad, I believe the gospel. I'm getting baptized at the, at the next navigators meeting. Well, how many times does it have to be meaningful to the person that the baptism kind of sticks? Now think about this from another angle. Uh, and I share this story again. We had a, a woman who attended this church. Uh, her parents were members. She was the oldest child. She went away, very bright, uh, studied English and English literature, and then... Um, ended up at a, uh, the best college in Florida, University of Florida. Sorry, Jonathan, again. Sorry. That's where I went wrong. I know. <laughs> That's where she went wrong. That's right. So anyway, she, she got into the, all kinds of isms and everything else, and um, she eventually would have said, I'm not a Christian. No, you know, if anyone would have asked her what are. She was into Buddhism. She was into some other things. She gets married outside the faith. They don't go to church. They got divorced. She, she moves back. She's going to work in the family business. And uh, the parents invite her to church. No, no thanks. You know, not really into that. But, well, they keep on her. And then, you know, six or eight weeks later, okay, I'll come. So I, I was telling Jonathan, I, I noticed her body language. I noticed yours too. Uh, and so as she's sitting in church, she's, she's like this. You know, not like this. Like this. You know, just really, really uptight, you know. And uh, so then she comes back the next week. I was surprised. And then the third week and fourth week, by, by about the sixth week, I see her lips just kind of moving a little bit with the hymns like they're coming back to her. And her hands are now like this. And she's holding the bulletin and reading the songs. And, and then a couple weeks later, she calls me, can I meet you for lunch? We go out to lunch. She says, um, the weirdest thing has happened. I don't really know you, but I've, I've believed the gospel. Really? And uh, she said, I, I completely stopped believing it. And, and I believe now. She goes to this class. She says, I'd like to be baptized. I said, weren't you baptized in this church? She was actually baptized in this church as an infant. Now she's a professor at University of Florida. And uh, she had moved back down here. And I said, "Um, well, you've already been baptized. She said, yeah, but it wasn't meaningful to me. And I said, well, let me try to re-explain it to you. Imagine that when your parents baptized you, God, unbeknownst to you, invisibly, took the flag of the kingdom and planted it in your heart and said, I claim this for the kingdom of my kingdom. And then you, you know, ran, running from God like Jonah, you know, and God swallowed you up with a divorce and, you know, with some personal failures and spit you out onto the land and spit you out on the very steps where you were baptized. I mean, I introduced her to the congregation on the very steps Probably the same carpet, even though she was 30 years, you know. I mean, you know how the church is about the carpets. Um, so I introduced her and I said, now you see how meaningful this was, that God is making good on his promises. He put the engagement ring on your finger when you were a child. And you completely forgot about him. But now he's brought you to the same place and now you're saying, I do. What else can I say? You know, like, like uh, the disciples said to Jesus, where else are we going to go? You know, you have the words of eternal life. And she, you know, she came to that realization. Later, just to tell you the end of the story, she married a believer, a Baptist guy, and they made her get rebaptized. So anyway, it was all for naught. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, I, again, I, I don't, I'm not trying to say anything bad about my brothers and sisters here. I'm just trying to, to help you see why we hold to what we hold to. Seeing the unity of the Old and New Testaments and where the, the rite of initiation was offered to infants, the believer's uh, children were initiated into the faith through circumcision, at least the males. Um, seeing the unity of the Old and New Testament, we hold that the sign of the covenant or the ritual of initiation should be offered to believers and their children even more so than it was in the time before Christ. And um, again, seeing a couple coming to Peter on the day of Pentecost saying, we're Jewish, but we believe what you just said, that before the coming of Jesus of Nazareth, we were living in the time of signs and shadows and promise and now we're living in the time of fulfillment and substance. We'd like to believe. And Peter says, great, you two come this way, but let your children go off to children's church or whatever. Uh, I just don't see how that could happen. Unless you're seeing things from an, a Western American individualistic perspective. And in fact, Peter actually ends his sermon for this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off even as many as the Lord will call to himself. So anyway, that's our view. Again, it's not pointing to me or the officiant, and it's not pointing to you, the person getting baptized. It points to what happened objectively on a hill far away. Um, again, does the baptism save the, the infant? Well, the baptism doesn't save the infant or the adult. Um, and circumcision didn't save the infants in the Old Testament. It basically set them up to believe. And uh, whether they would be circumcised in the heart or not would be a matter of their believing. And whether someone will be only outwardly baptized or inwardly cleansed as well, um, that's a matter of the person believing under the influence of the Holy Spirit. All right, now, on this side, again, with, as we look at... Um, we, we, there's more questions I know about baptism, like the mode, why don't, why don't we immerse people, and you know, we could talk about that, but um, I think that's, you know, we, we were for many weeks on the trunk of the tree, now we're kind of branching out, I don't want to go too far off to the twigs, because we might fall off the tree altogether, so if you have a question about the mode, or that, that kind of thing, uh, we can talk about that, but uh, I'll leave, leave that much for now. Um, I want to talk just a little bit more, as I did last week, about uh, church governance, and then we'll talk a little bit, very briefly, about prayer for spiritual growth, and then that'll be the end of it. Um, when it comes to church government, uh, Missy and I, I, I mentioned this last week, we, we were in a church in North Carolina, where uh, South Carolina, where there was an egregious, some sort of egregious uh, thing went on with, with the uh, minister of that church, and people um, left the church and he then tenured his letter of resignation. And then we went to the congregational meeting to kind of ratify the vote. When we got there, three times the normal Sunday attendance was present at the congregational meeting. It was on a, it was on a weekday night and we're like, where did all these people come from? Well, this was a very old family in the community. They called in all their people who were still officially on the roll but hadn't attended the church you know, for many years, and they still had a vote. Well, they voted to, to uh, reject the pastor's letter of resignation. And when he was, uh, showed up the next Sunday, he said, I'm so glad that my resignation wasn't accepted. I was guilty, and he didn't mention anything about the crimes he was accused of. He said, I was guilty of not tithing, not reading the scriptures enough, not praying enough, and not witnessing enough. Um, but I've repented, and I'm coming back to God. And, you know, everybody wanted to raise their hand and said, yeah, but what about the blank situation that was going on, which was criminal, you know? And uh, so then we called the local association and said, hey, could you come and you know, send your board of inquiry? Well, we don't have a board of inquiry. And that's what kind of got us started thinking, it would be nice if someone could come in from outside the congregation and exercise some authority. And um, we ended up uh, gravitating toward Presbyterianism. They don't have a bishop, we don't have a bishop, except we have a corporate bishop. So once 
a quarter, uh, representatives from this congregation and from every other congregation in our communion, uh, which is Dade and Broward County. We have one church in Cayman Islands as well. Uh, representatives from each church will come to a meeting, and uh, we actually review the minutes. Uh, so we have to submit our minutes for review uh, from the presbytery. And if they have anything weird, um, yes? Yes, I have two, but one's too sexy for this class, too sexy for this class, too sexy for this class. <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you about the other one. It actually emanated from here in South Florida, uh, and here's how I learned about it. I married my brother, and I participated as a clergyman in the wedding. So we went to the rehearsal dinner, and the minister who was there was walking by my car as I was getting out of the car, and I had in the back seat of the car, because I was the Jonathan at that point, and I had just gotten back from the printer uh, the pamphlets for the summer activities. So as he's walking by, I said, hey, Jim, here's one of our pamphlets. So I gave it to him, and he looked at the, all that was going on uh, for the summer, and you know, he was an older guy that I really looked up to, and at that point, our, he was in our presbytery because the presbytery was bigger. It's since uh, divided because we've had more churches planted. So he writes me an email the next day, and he says, hey, I just want to warn you, you have a, um, activities on Sunday. So we had children's activities on Sundays, and it happened to be uh, during one of the years that they were having the Olympics, okay, every four years. So... That summer, we had small groups meeting all around the church, not in the church, but in people's homes, you know, in the vicinity of, of this church. And for the kids, you could drop your kids off, and they could go to summer games. Get it? Like the Olympics, summer games. And so we had, you know, kickball, and then they'd get them all together, and there'd be like a really short gospel presentation, and that would go on every week. And so he calls me or emails me and says, I just want you to know that there was a church in our presbytery that had games on Sunday for the kids, and it was deemed by one of the elders as a breach of the fourth commandment. So they're recreating on the Sabbath. All right? And so this guy made a big deal about it with his elders, and the elders said, no, we don't, we don't agree. So he appealed, took them to the next highest court which was not the session, which is just the, lo the elders of this church. This church has nine seated elders. We have other elders, but they're not seated. That's what session means, to be seated. So all the elders sided against him. Come on, dude, that's like a little, you know. Huh? Yeah, yeah, what a Karen. That's right, right. <laughs> Axel, what am I going to do with you? <laughs> that's perfect, yes. <laughs> So they, they said, Karen, we don't agree with that. <laughs> and uh, we think you're, that's a little too strict a view of, of the fourth commandment. And, uh, you know, the kids are getting together with, it's, it's in the context of fellowship. You know, I mean, that's, so he appealed to the, to the presbytery. So this is elders at that point, all the way from Vero Beach to Miami. And all the elders sided with the session, not the elder who, who filed the complaint. You, you with me? And then he went to the Supreme Court. He went to the General Assembly of our entire denomination and said, I think my session is an error and is breaking the fourth commandment and encouraging children to do that. And our denomination actually heard the case. You know how we've been hearing about this election thing? Is the Supreme Court going to hear the case? Well, sometimes at the highest court of our church, they hear the case and sometimes they don't, just like in the Supreme Court. Well, this one they heard, and they sided with the session. And they said to Elder Karen, you're too strict in your view of, of the Sabbath, and this is really an exercise of fellowship. And um, you know, even some would say recreation is really what the Sabbath is about, in a sense, the recreation of all things. I mean, we're, we're celebrating the first fruits of the recreation in, in Jesus Christ's resurrection. So I hope that is helpful. That just gives you one example of a case. There have been others. I mean, 
uh, early in the founding of the, of the Presbyterian Church, I think, uh, Phil, are, you're from Al- Alabama, aren't you? Then I'll say this was from Mississippi. Uh, <laughs> but it was a church in Alabama or Mississippi, probably Mississippi, you know Mississippi, uh, said, I think we live in a dry county where you can't, couldn't buy alcohol, and we think alcohol is evil and that um, Presbyterian, m- members of Presbyterian churches should sign a paper saying that I will not drink alcohol. And if not the members, then the elders and the deacons. And so the whole presbytery agreed, and they, they asked the Supreme Court of the denomination, would you please make this an ordination requirement? And they put together a pastoral study committee, and uh, they came up with, and I, I can show you the actual ruling. It's about that long on one sheet of paper. One page. It says, the fermentation process was given to us by our Creator as a sign of joy. In other words, wine is a symbol in the Bible for joy. the, The consumption of wine as a pleasure can be a danger and therefore should be engaged with care because people can get addicted to it or you can cause another brother or sister to stumble. And other than that, that's it. I mean, it was like that long. 30 years later, the same uh, commission, again, it was made up of different elders at this point, were asked to write a paper on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And their decision there was 100 pages long. Just, just so you know, we have that in a book too. But um, when it came to alcohol, you know, we looked to the higher authority. What does the scripture say? And they d- kind of decided it for us as a denomination. All right, any questions on the appellate process or the, or the church courts, as we call them, the lowest court being the session, the elders of the local church, the next highest court being the presbytery, and the highest court uh, being the general assembly. By the way, in the PCUSA, they had a fourth court, which they called the synod, and that would be like uh, three states maybe, like uh, Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, that kind of thing. All right, any questions about... Well, the only hierarchy is that, again, the lowest court, the middle appellate court, and then the highest court. So that, that would be a kind of hierarchy. But as I said last week, if I came up with a really weird idea and Bonnie said, you know, I can handle TJ's weirdness, but this one has gone off the charts, you know, and, and she goes to the elders of the church and says, there's a problem here. And then the elders, you know, ask me about it, and I say, Bonnie's kind of, you know, troublemaker or whatever, and... And they say, all right, we'll, we'll go with TJ on this one. And then I appeal, or she appeals, and it's required in the Presbyterian Church that if a person makes a complaint, they be given instructions on how to, how to file an appeal. So if she appeals and goes to our, the next highest court, the Presbytery, and I can somehow, you know, because I have been in this Presbytery for a long time. I know I'm only, I look like I'm only like 30, but I've actually been in this church 30 years. And um, so I know all the elders and suppose, again, I could work like some sort of magic on them and get them all to come over to my side, which I can't. I can't even do it with our elders in this church. Uh, I've been wanting them to, you know, to put in a pastoral hot tub for years, and they, and they just won't do it. Um, but even if I could get all the elders on my side, if she appeals again, which persistent Bonnie would definitely appeal again, and goes to the highest court... There's no way I'm going to know 1,500 elders from all over the United States. So to me, uh, to me, that's the guarantee of the class. You know, you want a warranty. And if, you know, Anna goes to uh, put a new dishwasher in her apartment and she goes to Home Depot, she's going to say to the salesperson right before she checks out, oh, by the way, is there any warranty on this Bosch dishwasher that I'm buying? And, you know, she or he will say, yeah, there's a six-month limited warranty for parts and labor or whatever. Um, and, you know, when we make a purchase, we want to see, is there, any, you know, is there anything behind the purchase to, 
to protect me as a, as a consumer. Well, you're not religious consumers, but we are asking you to make a commitment. And committing your whole life to people, you know, is a, is a big deal in, in a society where we don't like commitment. So if I were you, I'd want to say, TJ, that's a big ask that you're making. Is there any guarantee that it won't go weird? And um, I can point to this to say, yeah, I mean, if it ever gets doctrinally or practically weird, you can have a, a recourse. You know, you can go to the elders, you, a, appellate court, and even to the highest court. Yes? So what kind of investigation do you Oh, if you ever want to see it, you can go online. Just look on, under Book of Church Order. In fact, if you search under six letters, this will come up. No kidding. B-C-O, then a space, P-C-A. That's all you have to do. B-C-O, P-C-A. It'll come up and you can read the whole thing. There's instructions in there on how to gather evidence. For instance, uh, a husband would never be required to tattle on his wife. And that's, that's right there in the Book of Church Order. Uh, evidence has to come by the mouth of two or three witnesses. All these ideas from the Bible. You might say, well, that's weird. I've never heard of a church that has like a legal document for a constitution, but we do. Why? Because the Apostle Paul was concerned that Christians were taking other Christians to court. And, you know, Joanna takes me to court, and then she says, that rat fink guy, you know, sold me a car. There was no engine in it. And then I said, yeah, but she's, uh, yeah, no, no, her husband's in the military and uh, 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 covenant college. And, uh, uh, uh. and then, you know, the unbelievers are like, I thought Christians were all about love. I mean, these guys are like a bunch of hypocrites. And Paul said, You're, you are defiling the gospel. Don't take each other to court. Settle it. And then he says, can't you put together a simple court? And the Presbyterians took that seriously and actually came up with the Book of Church Order. You know, there was a time when uh, two, two brothers, they're, they're not blood brothers, but they're both believers, one attended a pres this church and another attended a brethren church, which brethren, by the way, also take very seriously the role of elders. They were buying houses, repairing them, and flipping them, Okay. Two young guys. I mean, they were like 20. I think they read that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Is it all right? So they read that book, and they're out there trying to score a bunch of houses and sell them. Well, right at the time when they bought a house, the one guy was called away, and the other guy did almost all the work. Then when they sold the house, he wanted a 50% share. And he said, hey, man, you know, I would do it for you if I were here. I just couldn't be there. And he said, yeah, but I did all the work, and my family needs this money. And, and so he called me, TJ, what do we do? And I said, I'm going to put one of our elders in touch with one of his elders from their church. And they actually met at our house and sat at the dining room table and worked it out. You know, they didn't have to go to court. Um, and, to, you know, we've had many situations like that in the life of the church where people um, have to take seriously all the one another mandates from the Bible and uh, work things out. So, uh, yes. If you, if you read that, um, if you read the Book of Church Order, it's almost like a simple law manual. You know, and it's all in answer to that mandate. Can't you decide these situations? That's the passage where he says, don't you know that you're going to judge angels you know, when you get to heaven? So shouldn't you be able to judge like, you know, minuscule little disputes in, in the congregation? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we had a situation uh, in our presbytery where this elder, and I mean, it literally seemed like the guy uh, lost it. And he wrote like 600 emails to the, his own elders. Don't do this. You're doing this. This is wrong. This is evil. Da, 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 da. He, he, wasn't, he was an attorney, and he, you know, he was, give me the language. Give me the language. I know how attorneys can be. And he gave them the language, and he, he was kind of well-known attorney actually in the state of Florida. And uh, it got to the point where it was just uh, obsessive and weird, and he was literally excommunicated from the church. So he was uh, not allowed to take communion. Now, he could say, you know, forget you guys, I'm going to take communion. But um, the church doesn't have political power. We don't have legal power, but we do have ecclesiastical power. And 
The keys of the kingdom are to be exercised in certain situations. Now, I think this guy repented and came back to a church and said, you know, I was really off the rails or whatever. So uh, that's, that's the disciplinary action that can, can be taken. Yes, if it's a civil matter, for instance, a child abuse situation, if that ever happened in the life of the church, it's a civil matter, so the civil authorities would be called in. But again, a personal dispute where it's a matter of are you pressing charges or not, we would ask the person, you know, have you considered these particular scriptures and would you look to the church to help you, uh, you know, work that out. All right, just a couple words, and I, we always give short shrift. You remember the verse that we're looking at says they were continuously devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So I got five minutes for prayer, which isn't that kind of symbolic of the Christian life, sadly. Uh, really, really, I want to just give you like a teaser. And uh, one of the things that we do in this class is we offer a series of seven what we call core curriculum classes. And uh, you know, one is on apologetics, how to basically defend the faith. We have other classes on uh, how to basically interpret the Bible. I teach a class called Gospel Spirituality, which basically helps people to utilize prayer, uh, fasting, Bible study uh, as a means of growth in your personal life. So I, if you see it offered, you know, would love for you to take it. I think it's a really good class and helpful. Basically, though, what I say about Bible reading and prayer is we have unnaturally divided them when they really need to be brought together. And here, you know, I joked about the Navigators. Jonathan was in the Navigators, and I think they've been a real gift to the church. It's a parachurch organization started as a military outreach, and uh, they've tried to bring together what should not be rent asunder, which is Bible reading and prayer. Um, I find that people if I asked you, and I do ask you in the class, not that I make anyone answer, but uh, do you have some way of somehow systematically or at least habitually reading the Bible? And I would guess most of you would say, yes, I read a little daily devotional, our daily bread, or I read um, Spurgeon's morning and evening, or, you know, or, or yes, I start off every January and Genesis, and I read through the Bible, which I've never gotten further than Leviticus, but I give it my try every week, every year. So um, you probably use the Bible for spiritual growth in your life. But I would venture to say if you do it in the morning, oftentimes by noon, when someone asks you, Luke, what did you read in your devotions this morning? Luke says, it was definitely from the Old Testament, I remember that. You know, that's, a, that's about it. And I find what happens is we read the Bible. We know that we have to read the Bible and pray. So we read the Bible, and then we pray. And I think we should read the Bible and then pray. And we try to model it in the service. Like today, Jonathan will read uh, a short passage of Scripture from 1 Thessalonians 5, and then he'll model how it ought to be used in your own daily devotional life. So what's hap what happens in the Bible is God speaks to you and then leans in. Like, will you respond to me? You know? And if you know, Phil and I were having a conversation and Phil says, uh, TJ, what do you think about Tua? You know Tua? You know Tua? The quarterback for the Dolphins. And, and I'm sorry? Is that from Alabama? Okay, there you go. He says, what about Tua? And I say, I know that the weather has been glorious lately. <laughs> he says, no, no, I mean, I mean Tua, you know, the, the quarterback. And I say, I've never had arthritis. <laughs> and he's like, what? Well, see, God speaks to us, and then we talk about our arthritis. You know? and in other words, he, we don't respond to him. And coming from a charismatic background where I mean, they literally expect God to speak right to, their, you know, right to their psyche. And when my dad learned I didn't believe in that anymore, uh, he literally wanted to make an appointment with me to say, you can't have a relationship with God. Why not? Dad, what do you mean? Well, because a relationship involves conversation. You know, God has to speak to you. And my response was, 
he speaks. You know, he speaks, I respond. He speaks, I respond. Um, now I see it as, you know, your emotions are speaking to you and you're responding to your emotions. At least we can both agree that this is God's word, you know. So again, learning how to have God speak to you and then you actually respond back to God is key to prayer and Bible reading for spiritual growth. God speaking to you, you responding back to him. And I find that people, you know, who have that Genesis to Revelation plan every year, you can read the whole Bible uh, without relating to God. I mean, isn't that what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount? Um, the, the three primary spiritual disciplines of the day, which involved up, in, and out. Up, when you pray, do not be as the hypocrites. Out, when you give to others. In, when you fast. That is when you try to bring yourself under discipline. Don't, you know, rub ashes on your face and look around so that, you know, uh, Nicholas says, TJ, you look really bad today, man. What happened? I said, oh, thanks, Nicholas, but I'm fasting. And then he walks away thinking, man, that's a really spiritual guy. So of those three things, Jesus says, all of them can be used as a false place of refuge where you're blowing the trumpet about your own spirituality and you're really not relating to God. And I find a lot of people read the Bible, but they're not really relating to God because they don't see it as a give and take conversation. God speaking to me, and then I speaking back to him. So uh, again, that's just a little preview of the class. And uh, we talk about, we do some exercises uh, in that class. One is called Lectio Divina, um, where we actually look at the Bible together and then respond to it together. And I, I hope you'll take it, it's a good class. And that brings us to the end of our time. But this being the inquirer's class, I'm willing to go beyond the, the time to answer any final inquiries, any questions that you might have. Or... Yes? What were Calvin's Institutes? Calvin's Institutes were written when he was in his 20s. Which... Oh, what are his issues? Yeah. Um, again, he, he wanted... He wanted uh, more reformation in the worship of the church because he thought that uh, once you lose justification, as Luther said, the church had lost, um, that the worship becomes superstitious and weird. And Calvin, you know, agreed with that. Um, he is known for his emphasis on predestination, but um, he himself said, don't wander too far into this because eventually you'll find it a mystery and you may lose your mind in the process. You know, when you think, I'm totally responsible for my actions and yet God is completely sovereign over every synaptic uh, impulse that's going on in my mind, how, how can that be? And Calvin said, don't go there. You'll, you'll wander into a labyrinth and you'll never come out. So, um, I don't know. Yeah, he, he basically just wrote um, you know, what we would today call like a systematic theology uh, called Calvin's Inst Institutes, two big, thick volumes. Wrote when he was very young. Um, he had a you know, kind of a primitive word processor called a, a pen and a quill and ink. You know? And uh, so you just imagine these guys writing at that level when he's in his 20s. Uh, just, just astounding. But. All right. Well, thanks for being with us. Thanks again to Mark and Tracy for watching us from North Carolina, and uh, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.